Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for May 4th, 2023. I'm Andrew Johnson, and I'm the chair of this committee, and at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify that we have a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Utah. Present. Chugtai. Present. Vice Chair Koski. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. There are six members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, we'll move on to our consent agenda, and there is uh, one item on the consent agenda and one receiving file item, which I'll read for the record. Uh, the first item is setting a public hearing for July 13th, 2023, to consider assessment charges for sidewalk repair and construction that remain unpaid. Uh, the second item is receiving and filing the first quarter 2023 traffic zones, restrictions, and controls report. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda or any items that anyone would like to pull for further discussion? Not seeing any, so all those in favor of the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay, the ayes have it, and the consent agenda is approved. Next, we'll move on to our public hearing item number one. This is the 2023 Street Lighting Replacement Project. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item? Today, Mr. Chair and committee members, Joe Lauren, Project Manager, Traffic and Parking Services, will be presenting. All right, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Lauren. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, committee chair and members of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. My name is Joe Lauren, and I'm a project manager with Public Works. I'm here to present to you the Loring Park and Stevens Square, Loring Heights Streetlight Replacement Project, and to recommend passage of resolutions ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments and authorizing the sale of assessment bonds, each in the amount of $763,551.44 for the Loring Park and Stevens Square, Loring Heights Streetlight Replacement Project. This street lighting project is comprised of street lighting improvements along the roadway segments shown on the presentation map and listed in the project designation. On March 16th, City Council designated the improvements proposed to the 2023 Loring Park and Stevens Square Loring Heights Street Lighting Replacement Project. The purpose of this project is to replace the existing Excel Energy owned lighting system, including the wiring, street light foundations, poles, and fixtures with current city standard materials. The existing underground direct buried wiring will be replaced with a conduit system that protects the wiring to provide a longer life expectancy than the existing direct buried wired system. The entire street lighting system will be installed to the Minneapolis street light policy standards. The proposed assessment will apply to all properties within the project influence area. The assessment method is applied by dividing 25% of the estimated project cost by the total area of benefited parcels within the project influence area of the improved street lighting. Information has been provided to the affected property owners in the notices mailed to them as to how persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homestead property owned by a person 65 age, years of age or older, retired by virtue, virtue of permanent and total disability or military personnel ordered into active military service. Public Works staff hosted an informational meeting on April 27th at which we presented information about the project and the assessment and answered questions from attendees. This concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lauren. I appreciate the presentation and I'm gonna go ahead and proceed to open the public hearing and I'll ask the clerk if anyone signed up to speak. Uh, not seeing that anyone did. If anyone did not yet sign up who wishes to speak, if you could please uh, approach the microphone. And I'm not seeing anyone who's, uh, maybe, all right, interested in speaking. Uh, welcome, please uh, introduce yourself and then afterwards we'll also have you see our clerk to make sure that you are uh, signed on to the record and then also note that just for consistency we uh, give each testifier two minutes to speak so please uh, welcome and introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Yolanda E. Maya, M-A-Y-A. I live in the Loring Park area of 410 Groveland Avenue. I'm not sure at this time, uh, I apologize, what my question that I want to pose. I have gotten some information that was sent to my home, and 
I understand today is the proposal for the this amount that appears on the on the sheet on the proposal. Is today the day that the board is going to decide or approve on this proposal? That's a yes or no question. Secondly, um, I didn't. I was trying to listen to the gentleman speak, um, but I wasn't sure if he is the like contractor or the representative who is going to be in charge or that's presenting to you of the work for the lighting. Um, so my other question is how this rolls out to the resident, um, that this assessment and the amount uh, will be and how that will be communicated to all residents upon your approval of this proposal. I'll Excellent. sign in. I All guess right. you do. P perfect. Thank you so much. We appreciate you showing up to speak. And if there is no one else here to speak, what we would normally do, we don't do kind of the back and forth with questions. This is an opportunity to speak to us. But then after we close the public hearing, I'll uh, ask staff to address any of those kind of high level points around assessments and communication and the project. So. Uh, if you could please okay. see the clerk, and I, it looks like we might have one more individual here to speak, thank so you. thank you very much. Uh, please come on up and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Kevin Holm, and I live in the 510 Groveland building. Uh, I apologize, I wasn't able to attend the question and answer session. Um, I wasn't notified or didn't get the notice on that. But um, my question would be, are the, the lighting units going to be of a similar style as to what is currently there? Um, and secondly, I, I didn't catch the, the, the total amount, but uh, the way that the, the tax is gonna be assessed is based on a formula that I, that I didn't quite understand and um, I think it seems to be a pretty large map that I was seeing of, and I'm not sure of the number of lights that are being replaced, but I think we're a pretty small portion of that map, and so I'd just like some assurance that the assessment is justified for, for what we're receiving at our location. Excellent, thank you. Is anyone else here interested in speaking on this item? Anyone else not seeing any, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and uh, move this item before us so that we can discuss this item. And then I'd like to invite Mr. Lauren up. Uh, if you're able to speak to, I know we had some questions uh, during the public hearing around both how assessments are applied or if there's at least maybe somebody here that can speak with them uh, individually about perhaps their assessments or if you have some idea around when that information would be out. And then um, I can share that certainly this is uh, a motion to proceed uh, with the work and to adopt the special assessments at, across the project. And then I know there was also a question around style as well of lights that came out in communication. So if you or the team are able to speak to those items, that would be great. Thank you, Chair Johnson, for those questions. Um, so the style, the style of the light will be um, similar aesthetically to what is existing today, um, except for it uh, incorporates newer technology, LED technology um, that faces downward, so it's um, um, friendly to dark sky compliance um, concerns there. The, um, the assessment notification for the parcels within this project area were um, mailed to each property. We can talk to um, individual property owners, if they think that they didn't get it, we can pull up that information for them and discuss um, the amount or the process um, in more depth, um, but it does follow um, the standard um, assessment calculations of square footage that the city uses um, for projects, the uniform assessment. Um, and then I believe there was a question around communication as well in there to residents, any additional uh, communication that residents might expect at this point, or if they have questions along the way, uh, who do they uh, connect with? 
Um, they can connect with me. I will be project manager on this project um, through all phases, so communication, outreach, project information, neighborhood outreach, um, the bidding process, the con when the contractor is on board, I'll be working with the contractor um, throughout the process, so if there's field issues or field concerns, people can um, reach out to me directly by my phone or email, which is listed on the project website. We do have a project website, which is active um, with the project map, the previous uh, presentations to the neighborhoods, uh, frequently asked questions, and then the meeting dates were posted to the website along the way. All right, thank you very much for answering those and for residents that are here as well. Uh, I don't know if you have any additional presentations coming up. I, I'm guessing this is probably the only one, Mr. Lauren, is that correct? This is all that's currently scheduled, but if we feel the need that it would be helpful to the neighborhoods, we can well, um, schedule it, further meetings. Thank you, and I, and I meant more so today as well, so uh, that if they have any questions, they can uh, connect with you after this item on, on our agenda. Perfect. Thank you. And I see we have a question or a comment from Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, actually, speaking of that, I'm really excited to hear that we will be having more regular lighting updates. I think we all know this is uh, a big issue for many of our residents, so much so even Council Member Vita here uh, chartered a Get Lit campaign, so I think like that's recognition that this is so important to our constituents so looking forward to hear how you know that 5.5 million dollars and some of the opera dollars towards lighting replacement how that's going to be um, allocated over the next two years towards our you know uh, specific uh, geographic parts of our wards um, in regards to the the lighting um, piece in front of us today I just want to make sure I'm reading the fiscal note right so the special assessment that's the part that um, you know homeowners in the specific specific region they're going to be kicking in um, the PI tax levy and fund zero four 100 is that the part that we're contributing thinking of like those budget allocations that i'm seeing like the 3.7 million dollars so i want to make sure i'm meeting reading this right thank you council member wansley yeah the assessment for the project for the surrounding residents is the 25 percent and then the higher number don't have it in front of me right here but it, that is the portion contributed by the city Yep, the, the levy that you mentioned. Got you. And just for the public record, that is $3.736,449 that we would be kicking in. Correct. Okay. Awesome. I just wanted to make sure I was reading that right. Thank you. So the, the 763000 is the 25% and the... The total amount is listed on the, um, the project um, designation but it's not 3.7. Oh, I meant for the city contribution piece, it's the 3.7. I see the total expenditure, it seems to be 4.5 million. Is that correct? 4.5 is the um, total amount budgeted for this year, but that does include other work besides just this project. Got you, okay. But just in regards to this project, the 25%, that's the 763. And then what we're allocating from that, that's the 3.7. I see, Director Mack, yes. Yes, yes Director. Okay, yes. So, Mr. Mr. Chair and Councilmember Wansley and members, um, it, it, I'm going to help refresh everyone's memory. This is one of the seven areas in the city that has failed system lights. And so this is directly as a result of the work that you all did and that the mayor did last year to provide more money in, to, particularly for these failed systems. And with that, we also have gone through a process to help us understand better, particularly I would say that the, the Stevens Square, Loring Heights neighborhood, Stevens Square, uh, there's Ward 6 part of that and Ward 7 part of that. That area in particular had had, under our old uh, lighting policy, they had attempted to do the full 100% assessment policy, and that did not work. They only had, I think, less than 10% of residents return uh, the communication about that. And so we've gone through a process to help understand how the city can be more supportive of these lighting projects. So that's why that money is so helpful, that it is uh, helping defray that assessment cost, and it also is helping us move forward. I just want to also say that, uh, um, the Ms. Maya who spoke wondered 
who is this man? You know, what did he, who does he work for? He works for the city. So he will be working directly with the contractor when we have a contractor. In some cases, the city of Minneapolis does some of this work ourselves. In other cases, depending on our workload, uh, we do have a contractor. And there, um, certainly, when we're done with this section, you can step out and get his phone number and email to stay in touch with him. And I think the assessment piece was very accurately described. I want to be really clear that the assessment formula is not that residents who got the assessment are paying for this entire huge area. There is a way, and Mr. Handeland, who's here, uh, will you raise your hand, Jeff, uh, can also explain that to you, that it is uh, very much based on what is attributed to your property uh, having the enhancement. So it's not that you're paying for the part over by Loring Heights uh, in your assessment. And as you can see, assessments are paying for 25% of this project. The city is paying for 75% of this project. Thank you, Director. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Lauren. Uh, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Mr. Lauren. He is so delight. You are so delightful to work with. I thought I loved street lights. You love them way more than I do. <laughs> and you know where they all. You taught me in my office so much over the last year about street lights. We we you know we thought we had it all together with our get lit talk and everything. But you really. Uh, you know, educated us so much. So thank you so much for all you've done. And I'm so happy to see these type of projects come before the council. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Uh, any additional comments or questions? Not seeing any. Then all those uh, in approval of this item, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion carries. And that item will be forwarded on to the full council. Thank you. And for the members of the public, if um, you want to connect up out uh, after this uh, with Mr. Lauren. I think they will be, our staff will be stepping out, so you'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, next, we'll move on to our discussion items. And our first item up today is the obstruction permit fees update. Uh, Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Dylan Freed, uh, who is the Assistant Parking Systems Manager from Traffic and Parking Systems, will be doing the presentation today. And this will give, uh, I think, members of the committee a high-level overview of the issue, and then we'll go from there. Perfect. Thank you, Director. Welcome, Mr. Freed. And before you begin, maybe for committee members, I think there might be a handful of questions on this item as well, and so I would ask that uh, we go through the presentation first and save questions until the end, and then uh, please ask away, if that sounds good. And then, are you? Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. All right, welcome Mr. Freed. Thank you, Chair Johnson and committee members. Um, here today to present on some proposed updates to our lane use fees that are incurred uh, with obstruction permits that, that folks obtain. So. I want to start out by saying, you know, what is an obstruction permit? An obstruction permit is required when someone wants to block some portion of the public right of way for their private use. So some examples of this are a utility called Centerpoint Energy or Excel Energy. If they need to do some work in the public right of way, they need an obstruction permit in order to block off that space to do their work. Another example would be a housing development. If they need some space next to their development for construction staging um, or material storage, things like that, they need to take some sidewalk or a parking lane, they need an obstruction permit to do that. Uh, we, al we also issue them for a lot of events. For instance, when the Vikings have a game, uh, they need an obstruction permit to block off streets for their uh, traffic management plan. Or if someone is moving, um, and they need to hood a couple of parking meters for a moving truck. They would need an obstruction permit to, that, to do that. So with obstruction permits, um, some of them also incur lane use fees. And so if there's some sort of extended closure of a lane, a sidewalk, parking lane, a bike lane, a moving lane, we then start um, calculating lane use fees that apply to this obstruction permit. They're a per linear foot is how we calculate those fees. The obstruction permit program as it is today was established back in 1997 uh, into city ordinance. 
Initially, there was not lane use fees that were incurred as part of obstruction permits. The lane use fees came a couple of years later in 2001. The whole point of the lane use fees is to help um, limit the uh, impact to the public right of way, and it helps cover the cost of managing the, the staff for the program. The fees that were put in place in 2001 uh, for, for lane use were in place as they were in 2001 all the way until January of uh, 2022. In 2021, we undertook a process of doing evaluation of those fees and passed some proposed uh, new fees that went in effect uh, January 1st, 2022. In 20, 2001, when the fees were initially established, there was two different tiers of, te of fees. The first tier, the most elevated tier, was in downtown. So any streets, sidewalks, things like that that were blocked off in downtown had a, a higher rate. Then outside of downtown, the major arterial streets had a slightly lower um, set of fees, like a, a, a sub-tier fees. And that's what was in place, again, from 2001 to uh, 2021. In 2022, part of that update, we expanded, we created a new third tier of of fee for all other. So any street in the city now would incur lane use fees if that was appropriate for the obstruction permit. Any street that was not downtown or an arterial fell into that all other category. So the basis for this fee, um, as established in city ordinance, is that it is to help cover the, management, the cost for management of the program. So the staff time, we have a staff of five uh, team members that, that manage our obstruction permit program. We also have a permitting system, an electronic permitting system, that has a mapping tool capability. So the, cost, the, the fees help cover the city's cost for that. However, specifically in ordinance, we're allowed to charge in, include as far part of the formulation of this fee a disruptive cost. So there's a cost to the public when a driving lane is blocked or when a sidewalk is blocked. There's a, an ultimate cost to the public for not being able to use that space. And so that allows some flexibility in how we set the fees to help essentially manage demand for that space and help the, ensure that whoever is blocking the space it limits the uh, amount of time and duration that they have the blockage in place. So when, when we decided to, um, when we went through the process of updating the fees, um, evaluating them and updating them, we took into effect essentially two major considerations. First was inflation. After 20 years, there was a lot of inflation that took place between 2001 and uh, 2021. And so that amounted to around a 50% increase um, per just the index of inflation over that time. But we also, especially through the passage of the Transportation Action Plan, uh, there was a specific item that called for updating the lane use fees to better reflect the city's modal priorities. A lot has changed in 20 years. It used to be all about moving cars as quickly as possible in and out of downtown, right? But now, um, as we have come to prioritize vulnerable road users, pedestrians and cyclists more, we wanted to make sure that impacts to those types of travel were priced at least as high, if not higher, than the, the, the impacts to motor vehicles. And really, the, the, one of the overall goals of um, lane use fees is to help incentivize contractor behavior. The, it's primarily contractors that are incurring these lane use fees. So we want them to, A, you know, reduce the amount of right-of-way that they use, generally speaking. Um, B, when they do need to use right-of-way, we want them to prioritize, um, to make sure that they allot for the vulnerable road users. And three, we want to limit the overall duration of the use. And so to, to backtrack one point to the, the mode that they use, one of the things that often happens when there's a project is if they need, if a contractor, for instance, with a housing development, needs to take some sidewalk space and maybe the, the first lane next to a curb for some access to their site and construction staging, we do not charge them lane use fees for the sidewalk as long as they get out some Jersey barriers and make a pedestrian walkway next to their site. At that point, they incur lane use fees for the moving lane that they're blocking or the parking lane that they're blocking and not for the sidewalk itself. And so that's why we wanted to kind of flipped it on its head where we, um, uh, wanted to make it more costly for the pedestrian and cyclist um, lanes than for the moving lanes. 
So this is a fee review of what we did between 2021 and 2022. Uh, so if you want to look at the downtown, you can see in the moving lanes, um, previously it was $1 per foot per day. This is all these are listed in linear feet uh, per day. Um, and then reflecting the, the cost of inflation, it went to $1.50 per foot per day in moving lanes. So it roughly accounted for inflation. But then if you go down and look at the sidewalk and bike lanes, the sidewalk went from 25 cents per foot per day to 175 per foot per day, which is a seven times increase, right? And so that was how we were, it, we wanted to represent our, our goals around modal priorities with the way that we priced this. Now, it was not the intent of the city to make seven times more revenue off of this program. The intent of the city in doing that was to limit con contractors' use and disruption of sidewalks and, and bike lanes. And so um, that is kind of, that's how we set the, the, the fee increases for, that went into effect in 2022. Now, once we came to the end of 2022, a full year of this new pricing structure being in place, we looked at um, what actually happened then. And when we, what we did is we took all of the, the permit footage, the, the total amount of permits collectively in the city, we looked at that and we made, we applied the 2021 rates to what happened in 2022 and we made 250% more money based off of the 2022 rates than we did off of the, than we would have after the 2021 rates. Our goal roughly was somewhere between 75% and 100% increase. That was to account for inflation and the adjustment of the modal priorities. But we made 250%, that's 3.5 times more money than we would have under the old fee structure. And so we said, we kind of have a problem here. This is way more than we anticipated to happen. We've talked to some of the contractors who to have these permits and, and um, what we've discovered is there was kind of a compounding fee factor here. The contractors, as much as they could, they were limiting their use of sidewalks. They were limiting their use of bike lanes, but there was only so much adjustments that they could actually make. And so, um, yeah, we, we overshot our estimates in, in the overall fee values. So to get to what we're actually proposing for the lane use fees, we really wanted to continue to, um, to, we essentially wanted to double down on our modal priorities. We wanted to correct the overall fee, fees that we will be collecting from contractors to be much closer to that 75 to 100% increase versus the 2001 to 2021 rates. But we wanted to make sure we express our modal priority values. So what we're proposing is to actually further accentuate the difference between the cost for a moving lane that is used often to replace the, um, the sidewalk lane or to go around a development. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're proposing. Um, when we apply the proposed rates here to what happened in 2022, we end up around that 75 to 100% range. That was the original intent of the Laney's fee update that we did in 2001. All right, thank you. That's, that's the end of that's the it. presentation. Yep. And Director Anderson Keller. So Mr. Chair, um, by way of telling you about this situation, when I came here uh, a year and four months ago, I started to hear concerns about this. And honestly, I, sort of said, we're not going to look at changing this at all. Um, in the fall, after several more complaints came in and actually the threat of a lawsuit because the state statute is very clear about collecting a fee like this, that the city can collect fees like this, but they cannot be excessive uh, beyond what the activity is for. And you can imagine, after looking back at the RCA that was presented to the council in 21 and seeing what was told to the council was that the net would be about $500,000 per year over what had been collected previously. 
and that this would shift behavior. That was the goal. The goal here is behavior change, not revenue maximization. That it was pretty shocking as we went through and saw what was happening with the amount of fee that we were collecting. We're suddenly looking at in one year, $5.3 million, when previously, I think our highest year ever collected was something like 2.1 million, 2.3, and that was in the height of a, of a building boom before COVID, before anything else. And so looking at this 250% increase, what we tried to do here is get back to what we said in 21. We want to look at a 75 to 50% increase, which breaks down about 50% of that coming in inflation and 50% of it coming from the modal priorities. And we actually, as, as Mr. Fried said, we have accentuated the modal priorities. We really do not want contractors in the bike lane or in the walk lane. And we are serious about that. We will work with anyone to try to help them get their plan so it doesn't do that. But it became clear late fall-ish that we had to start working on this. And that's why you're having this before you today, is that we have completed our work on this and wanted to bring it forward. Thank you, Director. I appreciate that context. And thank you, Mr. Freed. And um, you know, I appreciate the, the presentation. And it's hard to talk about when the city makes a mistake on uh, an analysis and trying to get something right. And so, uh, but I think it's, it's good that, you know, this has been flagged and brought forward and that we we have it before us for discussion. Thank you. Council member Wansley. Thank you, chair Johnson. Um, I also want to thank you, uh, free for the presentation. Also, also, um, director, uh, Kelleher, you know, for both of you all being responsive to many of the questions that um, my office has had in, you know, learning about these uh, proposed changes over the past couple of days. Um, I, I do want to name, you know, I still have lots of concerns and follow up questions about this and would love the opportunity to have, um, you know, some more follow up with um, our staff and leadership around these changes regarding uh, potential realignment on these fees. Um, I also want to name my office has also been contacted pretty regularly um, with concerns from my constituents on some of the suggestions that's being brought forward. Um, so really would just like to take some time for us to you know, have more discussion around ways we can realign this. I know other council members have also had you know, conversations with you all about what's being proposed. Um, so just you know, in light of that and also you know, not foreseeing the lawsuit happening in the next two weeks, I would like to propose a motion for us to delay this just one cycle, give us two weeks for us to continue those conversations um, so that all of us can feel good about next steps and being able to report that back to our constituents. Uh, motion from Councilmember Wansley. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Chugtai. Chair Johnson, are, are we going to just table this motion for a second while we continue a discussion? You know, it's, uh, feel free to discuss what I had not, we heard the presentation. Yep. I did not move, uh, the item yet. So I'm taking so this wait. as a motion to delay the item. So feel free to speak both to the motion and to the underlying substance of this item. Wonderful. Well, I'll uh, start by seconding the motion. So that's been made properly. Um, you know, uh, really appreciate uh, this presentation. I know I've had a couple of uh, examples of um, these these lane use rates uh, that came up last summer. I know I had a chance to meet with um, with you and your team and talk a little bit more about how the changes to the lane use fees were made back in 2021. So, um, you know, appreciate getting a little bit more context and seeing um, how we're trying to to correct an error, um, but agree that this is a, a significant, um, one, thing that went wrong, and two, uh, thing that we're changing. And I would appreciate more time to um, 
to sit with this and, um, and ask more questions and make sure I feel really good about how this is going to impact, um, some of the projects in, in my ward or how it's impacted projects in the past and, and how, uh, the, the, the effects of that. Um, just real quick, a clarifying question. So in slide six, if we could go back one real quick, over here when you're breaking down um, the the different um, modes, like moving lane, bus lane, parking lane, sidewalk, um, I see that in slide seven we're missing uh, we're missing bus lane. Are we missing another one? And I'm. Can you just explain the discrepancy there? Excuse me, uh, Mr. Freed or Mr. Klugman. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Alan Klugman, uh, Director of Traffic and Parking Services. Um, Councilmember Chuck Tao would say, essentially a typo. The bus lane is the same as the moving lane for cost purposes, and I think it just didn't make it to that table. Got it. So what what you're saying, right, is this this is the the changes that are reflected in slide seven are supposed to be built to um, reprioritize the the modal shifts we want to make. But we we uh, I see that accounted for in um, the revisions to sidewalks and bike lanes as compared to parking lanes and moving lanes, but. It's going to be cheaper to take up a bus lane, even though that's a mode of, uh, like a, a transit mode that we want to incentivize. Right. So, um, Chair, members of the committee, that you raise a good point, and obviously, I think if this is going to be tabled, maybe there'll be more discussion about this. Um, I'll just say, technically, in the 2001 ordinance language, there is not a phrase for bus lane. And so for the, the years this has been in effect, uh, we've interpreted bus lane as the same as moving lane. Um, there are not that many in the city. They don't come up that often. It's something we can look into. But um, you know, again, for full disclosure, we've treated those the same as moving lanes in the past. Got it. OK. And th that's really helpful. I appreciate it. Um, and then. <laughs> Um, have we thought through what we're going to do? This might be a, a question actually better directed for, for Director Anderson Kelleher. Um, have we thought about what we're going to do for uh, the, the folks who paid that higher rate throughout last year and then this, this, uh, the fee schedule would change and so I, I can see down the road just a lot of frustration from, from those people, and what are we going to do to address that? So, Mr. Chair. Director. <laughs> Thank Please. you. Um, uh, Council Member Chugtai and members of the committee. I, it's a very fair question. And when we first started to dive in on the deeper analysis on this, we were considering whether to bring to you both this change and something that would uh, account for the roughly will be about 18 months of fees paid. The challenge here is one that you will all recognize. The construction firm pays the fee, applies for the lane use application, the underlying developer of the project is actually folding that into any cost of their project. Mm -hmm. So it, in order to not create a situation to al allow for a construction company to get a windfall, which is not tied to actual development in the city, then we have to look at something different. And so what we would like to look at is something that is developed a little like our stormwater permitting fee. So what it would do is give some credits going forward for future development that would tie to the past payment. 
and that that, but that's complex to design, right? And that's why we need to work with finance on that. We need to work with CPED on that. We need to work with the city attorney's office on that to develop it. And so it is a, a work in concept right now. We do plan on bringing you something in the next you know, few months. The goal here was to bring forward the fee change and get it changed as we go into a very busy construction season uh, with a lot of things happening out there and to try for those who have not applied for their permit. Anyone who's applied for their permit and paid the fee, they have paid. But any project coming forward, a new affordable housing project, whatever it is, uh, they would then be under this new structure. So it's a little bit of the of a two-step project process to figure out how to give that credit without giving a windfall to a construction company, but actually get it back to, I think, where uh, we would say the underlying issue is, which is wanting people to do housing development in the city or whatever type of development they're doing. Got it. And then do you have a, a, a target timeline for when this sort of thing would be figured out? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Chuck Tai, I don't, but how about we do this? I think, you know, if you, if you do delay or if, you know, we'll have another committee meeting here on the 18th, I believe, we can come up with a better timeline. We've really been focused on trying to get this before all of you and we'll have a timeline on development. Got it. And then um, I understand, last question, I understand that um, that this this was something that was supposed to generate what $500,000 worth of revenue ended up generating north of $5 million. Um, what's going to happen with that revenue? So, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Chugtai, I, I am not the CFO, but what I do believe, th this is a fee that gets paid into the general fund. I believe there is probably a balance on that general fund right now. So, you know, I don't, because it's general fund money, no one says this one particular dollar went here to pay for whatever else, but your general fund balance is sufficient that if we develop this credit program, that can account for it. And, you know, I would say that we, um, we unknowingly created a windfall for a small, you know, smallish amount of money from the city's point of view, but 5.3 million is nothing to sniff at, right? And so we created, in the compounding effect of this, a, sh a small windfall into the general fund. Right now, I believe that can be handled appropriately. If we were sitting here 10 years from now and we had discovered what had happened here, that'd be a much harder challenge to unwind. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Yeah, this, is, this discussion has definitely highlighted the need, I think, to delay this a cycle because there's some complexity here. Uh, my first glance at this as I was you know, preparing for this meeting was why would we make this adjustment? And I was fairly opposed to that, but getting this additional context is very helpful. But I actually usually start my line of thinking around like, what's the outcome that we're trying to accomplish? Because I actually don't care about fees. I care about the outcome that we want. And the fees might be the way that we get there. Uh, so from that perspective, and I also share a border with Council Member Wansley, and also have heard a lot about the types of challenges around obstruction and accessibility with our, our bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and I'm a biker myself, and I've experienced those obstructions as well. I wanted to revisit a point you made about the Jersey barriers and just kind of get a clarification on this, because again, my goal is for us to have accessible pedestrian bike facilities despite construction, and the, the border we share is on Como, and there's a lot of activity over by the uh, University of Minnesota. So you had mentioned that in the past, um, there wasn't a sidewalk obstruction uh, line item. It was just you would put the Jersey barriers to create a pedestrian path, and it would be treated as a moving lane. Um, so my question is, with this new sidewalk bike lane uh, fee, the goal, it seems to me that the goal would be to don't block the sidewalk, 
create a block the moving lane and put a jersey barrier up but we just weren't seeing the contractors actually exercise that behavior i'm just trying to make sure i'm understanding that correctly yeah so so the, there's a lot of different things chair johnson yes Council mr Green. uh so yeah it, it, there's a lot of little ins and outs and complications each project is kind of unique so as a for example so say there's a housing development right and then immediately next to it is the sidewalk. And then the parking lane is next, and then the bike lane, and then a the moving lane, right? And so if you know they're gonna need some of that sidewalk space immediately next to their development, um, maybe they'll need some of the parking lane as well because they need to stage a lot of material as they're lifting you know, steel and, and precast concrete and whatever onto their project. And then so, what will often happen is they'll narrow up the moving lanes as much as they can with temporary tape or whatnot. But if they go so far as to actually having to reduce the number of moving lanes, what they can do is like in what is normally the parking lane, they'll turn that into the temporary sidewalk. So they'll put a row of jersey barriers on the outside of that parking lane. They'll put an ADA accessible ramp to go from the regular sidewalk down into that parking lane and then pedestrians can continue on uh, through that, that side, on the temporary sidewalk to get through, and then there'll be another ramp to get back on the sidewalk at the other side of the project. And so when they do that, we do not charge them lane use fees for obstructing the sidewalk, because the pedestrian walkway is open. But we would then charge them lane use fees for the parking lane per foot fee for taking up um, and obstructing that, that parking lane. Does that? answer some of your questions? Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious about, in practice, it seems that the obvious choice here with the fees at, for a sidewalk and bike lane would be to never take the sidewalk and bike lane and to always use that jersey barrier to create the temporary sidewalk in the parking lane because that is such a significant fee drop. And I'm just, it seems like it's pretty clear here that the 2020 to goal with the, I'm just looking at ratios, right? I'm not even looking at the dollar amount. I'm just looking at the ratio and the ratio suggests if you wanted to block the sidewalk and do your staging there, it would be vastly cheaper to just bump out into the parking lane and make a temporary sidewalk. And we're just not seeing that behavior in practice. Is that what we're kind of experiencing right now? Um, it, again, it, it's really complicated because there's a lot of very site specific, unique details. So, so what hap So, it's easy to take a moving lane and say, yeah, you, there's a, absolutely a sidewalk that you can use in one of the moving lanes or a parking lane on a three lane one way in downtown, for instance, right? But what if the street you're on now is one of the the side arterials or a residential street, and it's two way traffic, mm -hmm. and maybe parking only on one side of the street. And now if the option is, you know, eliminate moving lane in one direction on that street, our team might say, you can't do that because I've can't. experienced We're not that in my ward, yes. <laughs> traffic around this. And so they may be stuck in a situation where they have to take the sidewalk in that case. Mm -hmm. Or we'll, we'll explore different alternatives with them to try to accommodate it. If we can shift, eliminate the parking on the other side of the street and shift all the lanes. There's just some instances where they might need to actually take the sidewalk, um, and it depends on the scale of the building and, and things like that. So, okay. I, I think what's made quite clear is it's appropriate to delay this cycle based on this discussion. So, thank you, Councilmember Payne, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Freed and Director Anderson Kelleher for doing this work. Last year, after um, being sworn in, it was something that I heard about right away. Um, I had no clue what the developers were talking to me about. I, I was like, what? And so I'm happy that you all have brought this forward. What I learned um, was that a lot of new black and brown developers have so many fees associated with these new charges and it really takes away from the overall project. And that's something that I want in my war. I want more development in War 4. And what I don't want to do is hinder a project because fees are cheaper in Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center and they decide to take it there instead. And so um, it was very important to me that staff worked on this and came back with something that feels more reasonable. I, this is the second PWI meeting 
meeting where staff has apologized for making a mistake. I love it. I, I really like where we're going with this. It's not very often that people say publicly, we messed up, we have to fix it, especially with charging more money, right? Like most of the time we want the money, but we, we need to do something different this time. We really need to make sure that folks have an opportunity to invest in the property. If that, it, the money is still gonna come into the city, whether it's in housing or whatever it is, it's just a matter of how we get it. So I thank you all for coming up with this um, new way of doing this. I, I really don't understand why we would delay this a cycle. I, I, we have a week before the next council meeting, before we vote on this. So I, I think it's, I would prefer to move it forward without recommendation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, council member Vita. Is that a substitute so, motion or is that? Before yeah. you get into yes. that, Mr. Chair, okay. can I say yes, a couple Yes, director, things? please. Sorry. Um, so um, let me just say, uh, I hope to end the apology tour of public works soon. Um, it, is, it is not something that is a lot of fun, but I, I do wanna point out a couple other things that I particularly, I did read the comments that came in about the RCA. And I think there are two things that probably need to be noted here. That is also, we have many uh, streets now in the city that are metered. So the obstruction permit is actually on top of the meter fee uh, taking that developers would pay. So there is also a separate calculation done for how long a meter is taken uh, away from the residents and away from the city because of a development. That's an important point here because there's actually really, you know, a two-part piece of this. One is obstruction fees, one is metering fees. No one's asking us to change that policy around metering fees. We are going to keep doing that. But sometimes I think people are looking at these rates that look low if you don't know they're by linear foot. And if you don't know that when we say sidewalk, we make that construction firm take the entire block of the sidewalk, 360 feet. Average city block is 360 feet. 360 feet. So when you start to do the calculation, you can see it adds up uh, uh, very quickly, and that's why we're trying to change the behavior. The other thing I want to say, there was a particular concern about around the University of Minnesota. I know several of you have had this concern about a development on 15th Southeast. So uh, I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, if you'd like Mr. Klugman to come up again. We are serious about enforcement of this. We do not mess around with contractors uh, and developers. So Mr. Klugman has some information about that one because I think if you read the RCA comment, you'd be like, wow, what is happening? Are they not enforcing? And I asked Mr. Klugman to look into this and I think he has an answer for you. Thank you, Director. Mr. Klugman? Yeah, Chair, members of the community, good afternoon again. Yeah, very specifically, the site we're talking on in Dinky Town between 14th and 15th, uh, 4th and 5th, kind of the old McDonald's area site, uh, we've received a number of 311 uh, comments, calls, complaints from a certain individual. I believe we're up to dozens of comments. Our staff has been out there for every single comment we've received. We photographed them, we videotaped them, we actually have a traffic surveillance camera where we can watch also. Um, and we've worked very closely with the contractor. I don't think we have found any violations. If there's anything we found that's of a minor nature, we've worked with the contractor to rectify that. Um, stuff is not the same as it was before. We've narrowed some lanes. We've had to have barriers and things like that, you know, walkways behind the Jersey barriers. So it is not, obviously it's not what it was before the construction started, but we feel it's a very safe and secure site that's allowing for all of our modal priorities to achieve their transportation goals. So a um, little frustrating, but when we get the calls and complaints, we do look into them. We address every one. And um, I'll just say I don't believe there's any um, real validity to the comments that are that are you know suggesting that it's an unsafe or inappropriate construction site. All right, thank you. That's helpful. Any other comments or questions? I know Councilmember Vita uh, raised uh, an interest in moving this forward without recommendation. I know half the council members on this committee expressed interest in a delay, um, and I'm curious if any of them have any uh, feedback on that. If they feel that having an additional uh, week would be appropriate given timing with the council. Council Member Chugtai. Um, well, I'm happy to share my feedback. I think um, I think that 
in an ideal world, we would have gotten a briefing on this item before it came up on a public agenda. And um, this is, it, I, I appreciate moving quickly on a thing like this, but this was this was known. Um, it was it it was it was known that this change would be made prior to an RCA being filled out, and and we saw it when the agenda became you know public, and so I think it would be appropriate to wait two weeks. I don't think that any um, there there isn't a, a significant problem that's created by waiting just two weeks longer to allow us time to. Um, you know, read through this information again and get a chance to ask questions. A part of the um, a part of the the problem here was, you know, I don't know where what what the deliberation at um, what the, the the what the deliberation on this body was like back in 2021 when these changes were made. But you know, it sounds like if someone had maybe looked a little bit closer at an RCA and done some back of the envelope math, maybe we could have um, interrogated or asked some more questions about what went wrong. And so I don't. I think two weeks is an appropriate amount of time to wait. And should that motion not pass, you know, I think we can. This body can then figure out what we do next. Okay. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions on this? Uh, I want to say I appreciate Councilmember Chuck Tai's question around this credit aspect of this or uh, some sort of refund. You know, I spoke with uh, someone working on a project in my ward who had already gotten the project approved by the city, had already gotten their permits approved, had already signed the loan, finance lockdown, everything good to go, right? And then this passed and they thought, well, that's okay because I got everything done in time with the city and permits approved and all that, and then got hit with new unexpected fees that, by the way, got added on top of all the other kind of risks and variables that they faced, including inflation, which I don't know how uh, many of you track steel prices on a day-to-day -day basis on the market. I don't. But I have uh, seen the chart before, and it's, you know, th these uh, fees went up a lot more than what we hear of for consumers in that 6 to 10% range of inflation. I mean, we're talking about 50% double, that sort of thing. And so uh, when you have all these other unexpected costs come in, and they blew through contingency, and then you have all these fees on top, it really has a dramatic impact. And so... I also agree completely with what Councilmember Vita said about uh, loving this uh, second coming forward and saying, hey, there's a mistake. I think that's great. I think that's important. I think that's being transparent. I think that's being responsive. I think that uh, is being accountable. And so I think it's really commendable and really appreciate the department's work in that regard. Uh, I gotta say, in terms of the, the delay, I'm a little torn. Uh, I am ready to vote for this today. I support this effort, but I also hear half of our committee members saying that they want more time to have conversation to look at this. And so uh, I think in that regard, it's reasonable uh, to do so. Uh, I think we can make it another two weeks and I hope that everyone can be sure to get all their questions in and get time scheduled with staff and that we can uh, make sure this is fully vetted for the next time we uh, come forward on the council. So I know that's the motion that's before us. And I want to see if there's any additional discussion or questions on that motion. Not seeing any, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. That motion carries and we will return to this item in two weeks. Thank you very much for the presentation and thanks to the director and the committee for all the great discussion on this item. Really appreciate it. Now we will move on to our second discussion item, which is uh, receiving and filing an update on Lake Hiawatha stormwater management. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting this today? Elizabeth Stout, or Liz Stout, uh, Principal Professional Engineer, Surface Water and Sewers will be doing the presentation today, Mr. Chair. Excellent, welcome Ms. Stout. Thank you. Uh, Chair Johnson and committee members, uh, thank you for having me here this afternoon. I'm excited to talk about Lake Hiawatha today. Back in September, council directed staff to develop a permanent solution for improving stormwater entering Lake Hiawatha. 
We were directed to specifically look at city-owned infrastructure to address litter and improve water quality. Uh, city staff took this direction as focusing on parts of our system where we have total operational control. So not looking at solutions within the golf course or at the end of pipe on MPRB property and not looking at management solutions for the stormwater entering the lake from Minnehaha Creek. There's an obvious and concerning issue with litter in Lake Hiawatha. The photographs on the right are from cleanup events hosted by the Friends of Lake Hiawatha, illustrating the extent of this problem. Staff from the Park Board also do lake assessments as part of their monitoring program. As you can see from the chart on the left, the amount of litter found in Lake Hiawatha exceeds what is found in all of the other lakes during this monitoring program. City staff have completed several years worth of monitoring within the main watershed draining to Lake Hiawatha. One of the most common monitoring techniques used is litter scans and hotspot mapping. This involves driving all of the streets within a watershed and scoring each block based on the amount of litter observed. A score of one means that there's little or no litter observed to a score of three, which means that 10 or more pieces of litter are visible in a block. This scoring system that we use is based off of a scoring that the EPA developed for nationwide use. Um, that scoring actually goes from a one to a five, with a five being something you'd see after like a large sporting event. Um, what we've seen is we just do not have fours and fives in Minneapolis, so we um, changed the scoring a little bit. That's not to say that there isn't a litter problem, but it is to say that Minnesota is cleaner than some other parts of the United States. Here are some of our findings. The area in blue are scored a one or little to no litter, with the areas in yellow having moderate amounts and the areas in red have the highest amounts. Litter scores from our hotspot mapping correspond really closely with land use, um, which is the, the drawing shown on the right. Um, commercial areas and high density residential land uses, along with transit corridors and bus routes, are the areas that are scoring those twos and threes shown in our hotspot mapping. Uh, this is really consistent with similar analysis that happen across the country. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the best management practices that were evaluated as part of the attached report. The first of these is catch basin inserts. These are installed directly into a catch basin and they collect litter within each catch basin before it gets into the storm sewer system. The benefit of these systems is that they're easy to retrofit into existing catch basins and they have a really low upfront capital cost. The main concerns around them are the number of inserts that would likely be needed to see a change, the possibility of them becoming clogged and contributing towards street flooding, and the amount of maintenance needed. Um, because they're so small, they would likely need to be cleaned out after every significant rain event. Um, in this, the main pipe shed going into Lake Hiawatha, there are about 1,100 catch basins. Um, we estimated that it would take about 20 to 30 minutes to clean each one out with traffic management and safety. This means that if every catch basin in this watershed were retrofit, it would take about nine weeks to maintain each of them altogether after a rain event. So just understanding the scale of what maintenance means here. The next best management practice that was looked at was netting devices or systems. These can be installed either directly in a pipe or at the end of a pipe. We focused on those that are installed within a pipe. Netting devices have been found to be highly effective. Um, in the city of New York, they, a specific one, Trash Trap, was found to be 90 to 90% effective at removing like the main, growth, what we call gross solids, or the main body of trash. They have a moderate capital cost to install and can be very effective. Uh, the issues with installing devices like this are the equipment needed for maintenance. You'd likely need to have a type of crane or other heavy lifting equipment. And there's a minimum pipe size needed to install a device in. If there isn't that minimum pipe size available, then a more costly retrofit of a full system would be needed. The next type of structural practice that was looked at are called hydrodynamic separators. 
These devices use a swirling motion to capture sediment at the bottom of a sump, but then also capture and retain floatable trash within the device. These devices have been used in other locations throughout the city, um, mostly for the removal of sediment and phosphorus, so we know how to clean them and we have the necessary equipment, and they do capture more pollutants than just litter. The concern with this type of system is that they're um, very difficult and expensive to retrofit into an existing storm sewer system, so we would likely use these in conjunction with a larger full reconstruction, whether of a road or of the full storm sewer system. Um, they do require more frequent maintenance, but due to their larger size, it would be as little as twice a year rather than after rain events, like those smaller catch basin inserts. Then the report looked at utilizing stormwater ponds to capture litter before discharging to the lake. There are several existing stormwater ponds within the Lake Hiawatha watershed that could be retrofit to collect more trash and then keep it from moving downstream. Uh, the cost of constructing new ponds is very significant and isn't feasible, but retrofitting these existing ponds is a fairly small capital cost and also has the benefit of ca capturing additional pollutants just beyond litter. The concern with this approach is that we are just moving the problem to another location. Uh, many of our stormwater ponds are used as recreational amenities with trails around them. Um, we would be moving the litter problem from the end of pipe at the lake to these stormwater ponds. And then again, you know, maintenance would need to be done to make sure that they, they are kept in a clean state. Next, the report looked at what we call non-structural best management practices. These are practices and programs implemented to try and minimize litter from even reaching the street or reaching our storm sewer system. The first of these practices is increasing the number of litter receptacles in the watershed. There's a very low capital cost for this implementation, and they can be targeted at the priority land use areas, like directly at bus stops. This type of program would require more public participation to be successful. As you can maybe see from the picture, this was taken during a litter scan last summer. Uh, this is actually at a bus stop, and there is a litter container, but you can see litter be in the gutter. So making sure that we have active particip public participation would be a critical piece of any type of program like this. The next practice that was evaluated was street sweeping. The city already has a comprehensive street sweeping program with all city streets being swept at least twice a year, alleys slept, swept once a year, and some priority areas swept much more frequently, up to nightly in some downtown areas. Street sweeping takes place from April until leaf drop in the fall, so for about eight months. Uh, the main corridors of this watershed are swept monthly during this time period, with other areas swept somewhat less frequently. This program captures both trash as well as other pollutants such as phosphorus and sediment. The existing street sweeping schedule for the city can be modified to spend more time in the Hiawatha watershed. However, there is only a limited number of sweepers and staff hours to, dr to, to drive them. So any increase in this area would mean a decrease in service in other areas. So any changes will have to evaluate this change in service and determine if there, we continue to have acceptable levels of service throughout the city. The report also looked at public education and engagement programs like adopt a drain, adopt a block or street. Um, we have adopt a litter container or ash receptacle as well as storm drain stenciling programs. These programs are low cost to the city and are also already established. Many of them, like adopt a drain, already have support from the local community and neighborhood organizations. In fact, adopt a drain in Minneapolis started as a partnership with the Standish Erickson neighborhood um, targeting trash in Lake Hiawatha and has grown to Minneapolis having the highest percentage of adopted storm drains of any community participating in this program in the United States. These programs are very successful, but again, they need active community public, public participation to remain successful. So some of the recommendations that came out of this study and report include increasing the number of litter receptacles in those priority areas, um, increasing street sweeping, retrofitting our existing ponds to capture more trash, 
and continuing and, ex continuing and expanding education programs. Um, it also looked recommended exploring new single-use plastic bans beyond the existing plastic bag rule, um, updating street design standards to install trash, trash capture structures such as those hydrodynamic separators, as well as green infrastructure on road reconstruction projects, and exploring retrofitting existing manholes and catch basins within those priority land use areas with some type of litter capture device such as a catch basin insert. We've already started working on this problem. To date, we've completed a couple of Unfortunately, somewhat less than successful pilot projects looking at trash screens and an end of pipe boom at Lake Hiawatha. We've also started implementing green infrastructure on road reconstruction projects. Those work to capture trash in the boulevard before getting to the lake. We have three years of urban scholar work doing litter scans, hotspot mapping, shoreline assessments, and litter characterization. And last year, the city updated our um, regulatory stormwater management program document to list litter as a pollutant of concern. And that means we're including it much more prominently within our stormwater education as well as good housekeeping work. In 2023, we are already committing to continuing to work on the litter problem Lake Hiawatha. This year, um, we'll continue to work with the Urban Scholar Program and continue to promote those clean city programs such as Adopt-A-Drain and Adopt-A-Litter Container. We'll be evaluating the existing stormwater ponds in the watershed to see if there are simple retrofit opportunities to collect more trash. Um, that'll be done this summer. We're also working with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District and the Park Board on the Creek Master Plan to see if there's a, there are ways to reduce litter coming from that source, from the creek end. And the next thing is the one I'm most excited about. Um, in partnership with Freshwater Society and River Network and the Park Board, we'll be installing an end of pipe boom system in Lake Hiawatha this summer. This was donated to us by River Network and we will be um, there's actually a, uh, a public event on June 3rd. I want to get everybody out there. Um, we'll be having a community installation and lake cleanup event on June 3rd. This boom system um, will be installed. Um, and as part of that project, we'll be collecting more data on what type of trash is coming to the lake. And we're really hoping to see some direct results through the summer in our lake monitoring program. Beyond this litter boom pilot project, there are some future opportunities that we will be, we will be looking at pursuing long term. We'll be looking into pilot projects for catch basin inserts or trash screens in priority land use areas. We need to better understand the maintenance needs and flooding potential of these devices before I can recommend installing them beyond a pilot project, however. We'll be evaluating the success of that boom system and we'll be targeting local businesses for additional education on litter and possibly looking into increasing enforcement action if that's warranted. So some final takeaways today. When I first started looking at this problem when we received the staff direction last fall, I was, I was really hoping that city staff had missed something, that we've been looking at this problem and I was really hoping to see from our consultant that there was some silver bullet there's just not. It really will take a, a combination of different structural practices as well as programs and public participation really in order to make any type of difference with litter, um, not just in Lake Hiawatha, but throughout the city. We wanna keep trying practices and pilots, seeing if they work, working through some of those problems, and then looking to expand them either throughout the Hiawatha watershed or in other areas where we're seeing litter problems. And then I think it's also really important to continue to work with the community and local businesses to find solutions. I wanna say thank you for your time this afternoon and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for this presentation. Are there any comments or questions from committee members? Council or Vice Chair Koski. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, Ms. Stout, thank you so much for this presentation and all of your hard work. I know we've partnered on things with Diamond Lake, so I uh, 
appreciate this. I'm just wondering if you can go back to the picture on the boom. Or the, can you just help us uh, understand this with this? I, I think I understand, but I could you just maybe describe it a little bit more in depth? And it sounds like we will see this in place this summer or yes. soon. Yes, very soon. Um, so this is a boom system. Um, it's actually a series of three different booms. Um, this pipe is quite large when it comes into Lake Hiawatha. And during storm events, there's high velocities. We had tried a pilot project with a single boom and it kept getting washed out. So they're putting three in series so that as those velocities hit, we won't get things washed out. It's a, a floating boom on the top and then there's a net that goes down to the, the lake bed itself to really capture everything that's coming out of that pipe as much as possible. Um, the, the corporation is, uh, is Osprey that's putting that in, but it will be installed um, the end of May, beginning of June, and we'll have some signage out at uh, Lake Hiawatha, more on the beach side rather than the golf course side. Um, but that will, yes, be installed within the next um, two months. Thank you, that's helpful. I just had seen the other pilot with the boom, so I appreciate the, the clear clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilmember Koski, Vice Chair Koski asked my question, but I wanted to say thank you so much for this work. And I also wanted to thank the city for partnering as a part of our violence prevention work. The city has partnered with the Northside Bulldogs who keep our drains clean on the north side. So thank you all so much for that work and shout out uh, the Northside Bulldogs and Coach Tate. Thank you, council member. Any other comments or questions on this? I will just say I so appreciate all the extensive work you clearly have looked at every angle, turned over every rock, looking for any and every way to improve the situation. And we're very methodical about it and using data to guide this. And I think it's um, good to talk about the fact that there are no silver bullets on this, that you really have to take a combination of different approaches to continue to improve the situation. And I also want to say thank you as well. I see a representative from Friends of Lake Hiawatha here in the audience. I just have to say that community effort around advocating for it and, and uh, importantly keeping this lake clean and healthy uh, is just so impressive and the huge amount of volunteer efforts that go into it um, just the amount of litter taken out and efforts to really connect people with our, our uh, critically important uh, system of water that we have here in our city is so great so thank you for being a part of this effort too and a partner uh, with the city and Director Kraft, thank you as well so much for all of your work on this and uh, Ms. Stout, just great job. I really appreciate this and it's very exciting. And I guess one question I maybe have is, do we anticipate as you continue this work and think about the next steps, um, perhaps uh, anything to come through the budget process or capital uh, improvement program? in terms of these BMPs? Um, Chair Johnson, we would likely put these in. Um, any retrofits would likely be done as part of um, paving projects just to get that economy um, involved. Um, that would be part of our PVR program that already goes through the, the capital budget request. Um, I think our next step is to evaluate if this boom system works. We may have kind of found our solution. Um, we already have existing programs that are going to continue when it comes to education and, and public engagement and the kind of adopt a programs, street sweeping, all of those will continue um, and are, will continue to be funded. Excellent. Thank you so much. And again, great job on the presentation. Really appreciate it. Director? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank Ms. Stout and Director Kraft as well. I also want to remind uh, this committee that you actually already voted on the acceptance of the gift of the Osprey uh, boom. Uh, I think it was maybe a couple meetings ago already. And so that I, I think it nicely ties together to being able to see what this is. And I too am excited because if this works, I think there's probably other future implementations that could happen in the city to keep our water cleaner. Absolutely, thank you, Director. And then of course, committee members, please come out to Ward 12 on June 3rd. So we'll, we'll check out the, 
the boom and celebrate it. So there you go. All right. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion and without objection, I will direct the clerk to receive and file this report. And our final discussion item today is considering a resolution related to Olson Memorial Highway 55 priorities brought forward by Council Member Wansley and Ellison. So I will uh, turn over to Council Member Wansley to present on this item. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, I'm really excited to bring this resolution uh, resolution forward in collaboration with Council Member uh, Jeremiah Ellison. Um, since the beginning of this term, I have tried to utilize this seat on the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee to build stronger relationships with you know, our North Side leaders and community stakeholders. Um, and in conversations with Council Member Ellison and community members, uh, removing Olson M Memorial Highway and restoring this corridor to what was formerly known as the Sixth Avenue uh, North uh, was a clear priority. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity to have partner uh, with groups who have lived and worked alongside the Olson Corridor for years. And I'm pleased to say that this resolution is coming straight from the community. Um, Olson Memorial Highway is a six lane highway that divides near North Minneapolis. Um, in fact, uh, the intersection of Lindale Avenue North and Olson has the highest crash rate in all of Minneapolis. Um, with that in mind, for years, uh, residents and community members have been asking uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, other government uh, agencies to step in and bring in safety relief to uh, this community. But you know, lack of action and continued pedestrian accidents have resulted in neighbors having to restrict their movements in their own neighborhoods. Um, just for example, um, the highway divides uh, the limited amenities available to families um, with Harrison Park Community uh, Center on one side of the highway and Sumner Library, library on the other. Um, and my office has been contacted by families who are frustrated that they can't let their children use these resources because they're afraid that they can actually be killed uh, from crossing the highway. Um, this is an uh, unacceptable reality that these families have had to live with, um, but it's especially disheartening since Heritage Park is home to the highest density of children in the city of Minneapolis. Um, during the first half of the 1900s, Sixth Avenue North and the surrounding neighborhoods was also a predominantly black and Jewish cultural hub. Um, it was also once a vibrant, diverse business corridor known as Sixth Avenue North. Um, it was a walkable community that had access to grocery stores, bakeries, entertainment, and also locally owned shops. It was considered the Bill Streets of the North, notably known for its numerous bars and music venues and was the heart of the Twin Cities jazz community. Black and Jewish residents congregated around Sixth Avenue because of segregation and the systemic devaluation of their communities. In 1333, the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, redlined neighborhoods like these um, for in incompatible racial and social groups whose mixing, quote unquote, contributed to instability and a perceived decline in property values. So by the end of the 1930s, we saw hundreds of businesses and homes along um, this route be completely destroyed and replaced with a wide highway cutting through near north neighborhoods. The placement of Alston Highway was a deliberate decision and it triggered several decades of continued disinvestment and harmful planning. Displacement, pollution, and economic disinvestment are all the results of many of these decision makers in our government agencies um, in, in their lack of regard for this local community. Um, and, you know, it's great that as a city we have an opportunity to make some re reparative steps, especially since we declare racism to be a public health emergency. Highway removal is a form of racial and environmental justice. This resolution is a first step in righting the wrongs of the past and bringing reparative justice to the North Side. When the community is successful in turning um, and removing this highway and having it be turned over to, to another agency, the city will have the opportunity to also um, work with these partners to fully utilize our resources to support residents in restoring this corridor to the once safe, walkable um, corridor that it used to be. 
So I'm really excited about this. I also want to take the opportunity to highlight some of the groups that have been consistent in organizing for a safer um, Olson uh, in Harrison area. Those uh, groups include uh, residents and members of the Harrison Neighborhood Association, Heritage Park Neighborhood Association, who have persistently led the charge for organizing for safety improvements for years. Um, HNA has also been um, an active community partner in organizing HUB for the past 10 years and trying to get government agencies to be responsive to this issue. Um, I'm also incredibly grateful for the dedication and persistency um, that they've shown. Also, shout out to Green Garden Bakery, which is a youth-run business that was initiated out of Heritage Park. It's received nation nationwide accolades. Um, this business um, is also home um, to, uh, it's in the area where we have the largest density of children, but it's also a success story because it was created because what, there was a kid in the neighborhood that actually was killed um, while crossing Austin um, Memorial Highway in these kids gathered together and formed this, this business to raise dollars um, to support that kid and their family. So I wanna hold that, um, you know, the lives that we've lost as a result of this highway. I also wanna thank our streets, Minneapolis, for their advocacy on this project. Um, they've joined neighborhood, neighborhood um, associations like Her Harrison Neighborhood Association and Heritage Park residents in bringing significant national attention to this. Um, their advocacy actually led to Alston Memorial Highway being named as one of the 10 highways in the Freeways Without Futures Report, which has had success in nominating highways to be later demolished and turned into more humane-centered designs over time. So I just want to name the um, just expansive list of partners that have brought attention to this, that have done just authentic, um, deep relational organizing in their communities that's included door knocking, hosting events, community sessions, um, to really make sure that this resolution and the, the vision for uh, transforming this corridor is rooted in the lived experiences and brilliance that exists in Northside. And I'm really excited to continue to support um, our partners in realizing the Bring Back Six vision um, and looking forward to collaborating with our North Siders to make sure that we can do that work and ensure that this community has a vibrant and sustainable co corridor um, that they've been asking for for years and knowing that they deserve it and we have the opportunity to make that happen. So thanks for letting me give some historical and contemporary context for why this resolution um, is pretty significant. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Uh, and Director, I'm wondering if we have anyone here from the department able to speak about upcoming work on this and kind of the state of where things are at. So Mr. Chair, I, I don't want to belabor the meeting longer th than you want, but we did ask uh, to be on deck today, sort of uh, to come in to, to hit here if you would like to hear a little bit more. Both Jenny Hager, Director of Transportation Planning and Programming, and uh, Ethan Fowley is here as well uh, because both Vision Zero, uh, our Vision Zero work has been deeply rooted in this. And in fact, I think Ethan might say a few words about that work right now to be able to make this much safer. It, it is definitely one of the uh, highest injury roadways we have and it needs it needs a lot of attention thank you director i think that'd be good to just to get even a, a very brief uh, understanding of uh how this roadway will be improved moving forward thank you sure uh, chair johnson uh, council members uh, my name is ethan Foley, vision zero program coordinator in public works um so we have been looking at uh olson for quite a while and it is as was mentioned identified as a high injury street something we worked with MnDOT last year on some initial pilot changes we could do on Olson last year. Um, and we've been working with uh, Olson, Kathleen, Mayo from our uh, division has been engaged in a planning study um, that MnDOT has been leading, uh, looking at the whole Highway 55 corridor going west, but especially this part of Olson. So we've been really engaged in this. Um, part of that, we have the opportunity that MnDOT is looking at that very much as being able to inform a future projects coming up that they're looking to scope for 2027. And so I think, you know, this is very timely and we're very much engaged in this, this project. 
there is very much a, a need for considerable safety and community and, uh, and livability improvements here. We see those opportunities as well, and so we appreciate the conversation and very much look forward to continuing to partner with community members and MnDOT and other agencies and looking at the details of how we can bring that to fruition. Great, thank you. It really helps to know that date too of 2027. So, and uh, and the efforts that will take place around that. Uh, any additional discussion or comments on this item? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That motion carries. And with that, uh, we've concluded all the items before this committee today. And without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.